just very quickly where you were born and raised. I was born in Aberdeen, Washington, um, 1967, and I lived between Aberdeen and Montesano, which is 20 miles away. How do you spell that? Montesano? Yeah. M-O-N-T-E-S-A-N-O. And I moved back and forth between relatives' house throughout my throughout my whole childhood and, and Your parents until high up, school. Split up, yeah. Yeah, when I was um, seven. All right, here we are, and today is a special episode dedicated to the 20th anniversary of Heavier Than Heaven, the definitive biography of Kurt Cobain. So we're talking with Charles R. Cross, the author who got uh, just insane access to Kurt's belongings, like his diaries and documents and letters, just personal belongings. So he was able to paint a really great portrait of Kurt, but also he kind of did that from a thousand different angles. He really uh, dug around and found old friends and people that hadn't even previously been interviewed about Kurt. So all these years later, the book holds up as the book on Kurt Cobain. So it was really interesting to hear him talk about all that stuff and his early connections to the whole sub pop scene and, uh, how it was writing about a guy who became, you know, a mythical figure and uh, humanizing him. So that's what we talk about today is the, the human side of Kurt Cobain. And uh, just by chance, he happened to be visiting a friend's house and he wasn't too far from Aberdeen where Kurt grew up. So uh, it was just a coincidence that he happened to be back in Kurt's old hood and so yeah, it was a fun talk, and here he is, Charles R. Cross, talking about Heavier Than Heaven. Please welcome South Park artist Nirvana. All right, Charles, thank you uh, for coming on. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is, is it now the 20th anniversary of Heavier Than Heaven? Uh, correct. Yeah, that book came out uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Pretty amazing. Yeah, and I'm getting old because that still feels like the new Nirvana book or Kurt Cobain book to me. So, yeah, it's crazy it's been that long. So uh, it'll be interesting to dig back and talk with you about how you approach the book. You know, I'm a journalist, so I find that stuff interesting. But first of all, I guess we'll just get started on when was the first time you ever remember hearing about Nirvana? I know that you worked at the local paper and stuff like that, but would you recall the first time you started hearing about them? Well, yeah, I, I not only worked at the local paper, I was the editor of, of The Rocket, which didn't mean that I was up on every act. I mean, the editor of the paper has a lot of responsibilities, but you know, I knew Sub Pop began essentially as a column. Bruce had started off as a fanzine, but then made a column in the rocket called Sub Pop. And that was what Sub Pop was in the world for about, I think, eight years prior to him starting the label. So I was well aware of Sub Pop and Bruce. And in fact, Jonathan Poneman, who's the other partner in Sub Pop, I'd actually designed his album cover when he was in a rock band called The Tree Climbers. I, I designed about a dozen album covers, and his was one of them. And so I knew those guys, but Nirvana was simply a record that Sub Pop were putting out on. They were not the band, and, and uh, you know, I even talked to Poneman recently about this, kind of jokingly. So much of the story becomes apocryphal after Nirvana had the success they did, after um, Sub Pop had the success they did. Through maybe late 89, maybe early 90, no one thought that Nirvana really were the shit. 
So many of the stories end up becoming apocryphal. You know, I certainly remember hearing the single and I really liked it because I like the shocking blue and I like the poppy sound of Nirvana. I've always been a person, my musical taste is very varied. You know, I I, uh, was a huge fan of the Ramones and and there's plenty of punk in my background, but I, I like pop music and of the sub pop releases, I always tended more towards the groups that were pop. So I definitely liked Nirvana on the sub pop roster, but I did not think and no one thought that they were going to be huge until Nevermind was recorded and those songs came together. Yeah, Um, I mean, yeah, because all those guys, you know, and sorry to interrupt, but all those guys in Nirvana, or at least Kurt, I remember saying in your book that some of the people in the scene kind of looked at them as the, they were the kind of like the hayseed small town guys, or maybe that was Olympia, but like that whole scene back then, they didn't really look at Nirvana as like, wow, these guys are about to, to really break through at all. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, it's worth noting that, you know, all the way through uh, October of 1991, Everything shifted about Halloween of 1991, but even the first early success of Nirvana and Nevermind, some people thought, well, this record's going to be a pop record and sell a hundred thousand, maybe a couple hundred thousand, and then they aren't going to be a success or that it'll be, you know, there'll, there'll be another band and that Mudhoney is still going to be the biggest band or or Soundgarden, or Alice in Chains. Nirvana really um, changed things with Nevermind, but it really changed things in the couple months in the fall where suddenly the record became a phenomenon, not just a hit. But even with the time of once Nirvana are stars, even that is just so shaded by history, where everyone thinks, well, of course they were the biggest band in Seattle by the time Nevermind was released. That's not true. They weren't the band that was even played most on the radio in September and October of 91. Or, frankly, in the middle of the summer of 92, Pearl Jam were played more on Seattle radio than Nirvana, though at that point Nirvana had outsold Pearl Jam. Wow. So these are these are shades that I think get lost in history because the impact of Nirvana were so great right. that people lose that yeah there well there's lots Um, of uh, myths and you know misconceptions it's like when the legend becomes the truth kind of a thing and then a lot of that had to do with kurt too i mean he had all sorts of things that he made up about himself and you mentioned that throughout your book about oh here he goes with the living under the bridge story (laughs) and all that stuff so how was that uh when you were writing the book differentiating people you know either kurt blowing smoke or other people blowing smoke was that a problem when you were writing this book yeah, absolutely. Um, there's the myth and there's the stories he told. And even though I knew many of those stories weren't true or completely true, I think I was surprised in the end at how many of his stories weren't true and how much he had shaded that history. And yet, I mean, as a biographer, there were other parts of his life that I also was just aghast at in the other way. There were things he didn't tell about his life abuse, neglect, and crappy things Kurt did that were left out of his telling of his life. And I knew that Kurt had come from a family of suicide, but when I actually heard some of what actually happened, he has a a grandfather that stabbed himself in front of the family. Uh, Even even that story is just unbelievable or, or, or very difficult to understand. There's basically four suicides in Kurt's immediate family. And and then the story, I think, in the book that was the one that probably, if someone were going to say, why did Kurt Cobain commit suicide? What were the factors in that? Everybody immediately jumps to these things that may play a role, but they jump to his drug abuse. They many times jump to his wife. You know, his wife was bossy or whatever. His they stomach, want, they want his stomach her. problems. Yeah, his stomach, his blah blah. And I'm sure all of that plays a role. No one commits suicide for one reason. I know the times I felt suicidal in my life. It wasn't one thing necessarily pushing me over the edge. It's everything. Yeah. And, and, and thankfully, no. And thankfully, nothing's pushed me all the way over the edge. But I've had chronic pain. I've even had stomach problems, which is a great irony 
writing a biography of Kurt Cobain. Right. Um, but the the story that just stands out about all others is how Kurt, when he was in junior high, walking on the way to school, happens upon someone who has hung themselves in a tree. And wow. at that point in your life, when you're in junior high and you're really impressionable, that is just unbelievably extraordinary. And the way that would have left you, I mean, the trauma of that, he never got counseling for it. You know, I, researching it and writing about it for myself, I need counseling. When was it that you first decided to write the book? Like, was it something that slowly kind of manifested or was it an epiphany that you had? Um, both, you know, even when Nirvana became huge, there were people getting book deals in Seattle. I'm pretty sure I was called and offered a couple book deals. Like Sight Unseen, this band's huge. You want to write a book about them. I'd written a couple of books at that point, so it wasn't like I hadn't done a book. But I'm not sure why I didn't bite off on it. There were a couple of books, two books that were written by people in my world immediately after Kurt's death. One person that worked for The Rocket occasionally wrote what you what has to be called a quickie book within 72 hours of Kurt Bean died and you know wow. was offered a amount of money to do that and went and did that so that shows you the idea literally publishers were calling and whoever picked the phone up do you want to write a book on Nirvana I'll give you x amount of money you got to get it together right away right. so a couple people did that and then the Azerad book come uh, comes out and uh I don't want to focus on that but there were many parts of that book that left a lot of the psychological parts of the story out and allowed Kurt to almost tell a PR version of a lot of his life. There are a number of quotes in that book where Kurt talks about how he's never been happier in his life. In his drug addiction and in and, and suicide thoughts are barely mentioned. So I really felt there was something there to tell. I think what started to burn me the most is that many of the stories that came out either as obits or thought pieces or histories after Kurt's death, many of them, and I saw a few that listed Aberdeen as if it were a suburb of Seattle. <laughs> now, quite, you can yeah. get to Aberdeen from Seattle in uh, a few hours of driving, and it, it, it only, I think, is 110 miles if you had an airplane. But this is not a suburb of Seattle. Psychically, economically, in every way, it is much closer to a burned-out industrial area of Cleveland or Michigan, Detroit. Or I, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to slam those cities, but that's this what the is terrain not looks like. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it, but it's a beautiful place. I mean, I'm, and as I said, I'm talking to you. What am I? Uh, 50 miles north of Aberdeen, but it looks exactly like Aberdeen where I am. I'm in a yeah. town that literally there's a chainsaw store, you know, in the main drag and a <laughs> diner and that's it. Right. So this is Western Washington. And I, I drove through countless clear cuts to get here today. And I also drive through countless clear cuts whenever I'm going to Kurt's area down there in Aberdeen. Uh, so you were asking me what my motivation was, and some of my motivation was that I did feel the story wasn't being told properly. And I think I, like a few other people, I thought that, you know, because of Kurt's drug addiction and, and people were still afraid about a lot of stuff, I thought people weren't going to talk to me or tell me the truth. And as it was, there were a few people I wanted to talk to that I never could convince. They felt like it was too fresh. The biggest person I didn't get for this book is Dave Grohl. There are a few quotes from him in there that he told me for articles that I wrote. I wrote the, I think I wrote the second, did I write the second or the first piece on the Foo Fighters? But I, I went to the second Foo Fighters show with Dave Grohl in his van where he had a bunch of unreleased Nirvana tapes in the van on the floor and then ran an errand. So I got to listen to some music that nobody's ever heard. So I, I knew those guys, but but he did not want to um, talk to anyone about Kurt at that point. He has just written his own book in the last month. I heard and, about that. Uh, no one can, uh, you know, you can't go to anybody and go, well, why, why don't you want to talk about your friend that committed suicide? You have to have some sympathy for that. 
And there were a few other hipsters that I couldn't get. But in the end, I got a wealth of people who told me more. I, I feel like I got the people. Kurt's mother wouldn't talk to me, but I got his girlfriends and his, I got Kurt's actual friend. One of the big things that is mistold in Kurt's life, he had three actual friends. And they are not people ever talked about, and they are hardly ever in any of Kurt's histories. So getting those people into hearing what Kurt was really like from them was more important to me than getting some of the people who had a lot of agendas to how they were going to tell the story. Right. Like, what was his friend Jesse from Aberdeen? Was that his name? Yeah, that was one person. And I remember hanging out with Jesse a number of times, and... Jesse's like, well, here's a cassette of Kurtz with all the things he recorded off the radio when he was 16. You want to listen to that? And I'm like, yeah, I think I do. That is an example of, you know, you find out more about somebody. But that was also what happened when I got a chance to access Kurtz diaries, documents, letters. It is often misreported and everybody will say, well, Courtney Love gave you access to those. A lot of them she did, but I didn't rely on her sources. I, I probably read letters that Kurt wrote from 12 different people. So, you know, Kurt sends a letter to somebody over the course of life, and sometimes people kept those, sometimes they didn't. This is in the era of penned letters. Yeah. And getting a chance to read all that do documents and track those down see paintings that Kurt did. This was not material from one source. It was from a number of different sources. You know, I spent three years or more than three years working on this book. I think I interviewed 325 people. It is worth noting now, and it's a real sad tragedy with this book and this story, that two dozen of those people are now dead. Uh, I would say wow. a dozen of them are dead from drug overdoses. A few of the people that, that told parts of the story that I that really helped are dead now. So uh, that both makes me really sad. It also really indicates to me how some of the struggles that Kurt had were not about any other individual in his band or his life or his marriage. Some of these stories of what it's like to grow up with poverty, addiction, uh, lack of resources, these are true of... Uh, both a region, a generation, they're not specific to Kurt Cobain's DNA. And I think that's one of the most important parts of the story that people fail to get out. They, they focus so much on his fame as part of his suicide, and they do not focus on the fact that this year in America, I think it was 78,000 people committed suicide. Um, only a couple of them are famous. So we're talking about a national an international and a human tsunami that no one wants to talk about. And if this were a kind of cancer, we'd have treatments, we'd have vaccines. People don't talk about the struggles of depression or chronic pain, and uh, they should. Yeah, it's uh, and it seems like a lot of that started, like, or at least the beginning of what was kind of a downward spiral for Kurt was – uh, what you said in the book was like the week that Nevermind came out was when he really started getting into drugs, and perhaps that was a catalyst for something that, of a of a downward spiral. Do you think that? Do you still think that's true? Yeah, I, I I think when you're talking about somebody's mental health, I mean, not to I'm not trying to argue with you, but right. even the the term downward spiral can can try to point to one thing or to try to talk about, you know, I mean, Kurt was threatening suicide at 14. So if you want to say his downward spiral, when did it start? Right, it started right. The day he was born, you know, uh, there were parts of his childhood that were idyllic and that were filled with joy. I go back, I think, to, I think it's around 14 when he, he has an uncle commit suicide the same year. Parents are fighting and, and divorce. There are just so many indicators. It's it's really hard to sum up where it begins, where it ends. Um, divorce. You know, I mean, divorce uh, might have been – I mean, obviously, that was a big – not just the divorce, but it seems like after that, his mother, you know, yeah, slowly lost interest, you know? You know? That, that many people come from divorced families and have great situations. Right. Uh, in my own struggles in my life, 
my take of is that addiction, um, despair, depression starts when somebody gets a sense of, uh, what do you want to call it? Otherness. There's a sense that, that you don't fit in. And that can happen to anybody in junior high if you're not the head of the football team or a cheerleader. That otherness can happen very early in life. But almost everybody that studies addiction, and you know, there's a, a writer in uh, Vancouver, B.C. named Gabor Maté, who's one of the best addiction writers that I've, that I've ever read. He has a book called In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts, and he describes mm-hmm. addicts, particularly drug addicts in east side vancouver which kurt knew that world he describes them as people that are looking for connection but that lack of connection turns them into ghosts and they are hungry and drugs come in and and get in the way but what they really want is connection and a lot of uh, you know addiction research which finally is starting to get talked about the idea that if we put rats in a cage and we give them heroin or we also give them the choice to hang out with their friend rats, the rats will hang out with their friends. And there you go. That, in a nutshell, is part of Kurt Cobain's story, was uh, he wanted connection, he didn't feel like he fit, and drugs were a way to escape the world rather than connect. You know, I was going to say, you know, eventually after his parents got divorced, he was couch surfing a lot and he got like passed around through his family members and family friends and all that stuff. Do you think he ever got over that? My dad was a psychologist, so yeah. um, and, and I I'm careful in terms of just what is said about anything. So I right. don't think the answer of did anybody get over that, you know, did did Jackie Onassis ever get over the Kennedy assassination? Yes. Yes, yeah, no not, one's going to ask. Him that. Right. So um, the the answer is, uh, if I said yes, that would that would be that would put too much emphasis on it because there are other factors in his life. And if I said no, then uh, that that's also misguided. Uh, so the his parents divorce. Let's just put it this way. The guy's third album have three songs that reference his parents' divorce in a way or another. And, uh, you know, he's got the literal line, the legendary divorce. I mean, how many people that are rock stars are taking their third album and writing songs about their parents' divorce from from 15 years ago? So, uh, or actually in Kurt's case, it's actually not necessarily 15. It's only like 12 years ago. Wow. But still... That shows you that it did play a role in his life. But what I object to, and I don't want to keep arguing the point, is that I think oftentimes people can blame Kurt's parents. I've heard people specifically blame his parents. You know, what a fucker his blah blah was (laughs) for, for whatever. And I think that's not fair. You know, Kurt's doctors, his rehab clinicians, his bandmates, his manager... There's a lot of blame to go around, but the blame begins and ends with Kurt Cobain. We, we, because he died, because he died so young and beautiful, it's very easy to find other people to want to blame. And he took this choice himself. This was not an accidental overdose. And uh, we have to at least allow him that humanity when we talk about it. What, what do you think about Courtney Love? Has she gotten way, way too much negative stuff thrown at her? Because, I mean, uh, reading your book, it kind of seems like they were kind of just like partners in crime. And that wasn't, you know, what some people always suggest is she was a bad influence on Kurt. And you kind of make it clear that that's not the case. So, I, well, I, I don't I, 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 I again, I don't think these uh, things can be answered simply. Um, so I, I I do disagree with what you just said. Uh, yeah. That uh, in terms of, I think at times Courtney was a bad influence on Kurt, but at other times Kurt was a bad influence on Courtney. Um, you had two drug addicts who married and had an unexpected child early in their relationship. This is not a good sign of mental health situation yeah. all the way around. Most um, definitely. But I think the. As a biographer, I was never as interested on how Courtney appeared in whatever USA Today popularity poll is. My job as a biographer was to try to track down and tell people what Kurt thought of Courtney, what his motivation was, what was their life like together. 
It wasn't to look for who was the victim and who was the perpetrator. And in their relationship, those roles switched back and forth. There were times where Kurt was the bad influence. There were times where Courtney was. They both were assholes, um, but they both also did things that were amazingly kind and, dare I say, romantic to each other. Some of their love letters back and forth just really shocked me with the endearing nature and the sweetness of it. My job as a biographer was really to talk and to address um, what what happened in my character. And I think many times people, when they ask me questions about Kurt or this book or other things, they really want to know, you know, what did Kurt think of Chris Novoselic or Courtney Love or Sonic Youth or Neil Young? And my job as a biographer wasn't to address those things as much. My job was really to tell the, the facts of what happened in his life. And it was not to rate everyone in his life in terms of likability. There's some very unlikable people in Kurt's world at times, including his family. But he nonetheless got the same siblings and mother and father. I couldn't rechange that. This isn't a novel. This is his life story. My book is also not a personal analysis. It is it is attempted to be a straightforward biography. You know, I'm also a rock critic at times and in a with a rock critic I you know, in that role I step forward and say, Do I think that Nevermind is a great album? Fucking yes, it's a great album. There's no other way to say it. I can tell you 20 reasons why in, in kind of music critics speak, but that's different than a rock a biographer, a biographer of any sort who's attempting to tell the facts and figures of somebody's life and not necessarily give you their opinion on it. Right. Yeah, and then, you know, when you're writing the book, Obviously, you you probably made quite a few trips to Aberdeen, I would imagine, talking with people and all that. And that's where you kind of unearth all this weird stuff about Kurt when he was a kid and uh, all sorts of weird stuff that went on. Um, but then eventually, Kurt also started getting into having like all the weird hobbies about the baby dolls and you know he weird interests uh, involving you know pornography and stuff like that. Who did you get to tell you that kind of stuff? I mean, was that stuff that people just brought up casually? Like, oh, yeah, by the way, Kurt had these weird porno mags and was doing all this. Uh, was, was there anyone who had, like, all the insider intel on that stuff? I didn't rely on one source, and I want to just reemphasize that because there there are misguided people around the legend of Kurt Cobain or the people around him. Any fact I put in the book, I tried to have multiple sources that could confirm. Some of the items you're talking about were items that I, I was able to get the information from Kurt's own letters and diaries. And after seeing that and seeing some of these issues, going back and then interviewing people, I mean, there's a, there, are fewer, there are a few people in the book that I interviewed 12 times. I have so many hours of recorded conversation with people for the, for this book, and that's not the way that books are usually done if they're done quickly. It's not the way I'd recommend other writers because you're going to spend so many more years on a book than than your advance or your financial uh, payout's going to be on it. I know uh, that struggle, but, yeah. But that's what I did. So if you ask me one particular fact, I can maybe link down in my mind and tell you who who initially started it but it's it, maybe it's just better to say that that yes there are many outrageous things in Kurt's life some of them i just simply couldn't believe uh, most of them came out of either Kurt's diaries or out of the stories of his uh, his childhood i mean i went and interviewed the people he grew up with first and i was already had my mind blown by that you know, when I when I tracked down the first childhood picture of Kurt, which had never appeared from uh, when he was at junior high and he's wearing a polo shirt, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, it was clear at that point Kurt was trying to fit in. When, when I found out that Kurt had been on the football team, you're like, what? Uh, if I'm remembering that correctly, I can't, I, you know, I haven't yeah, the book it, a while ago. Right, he was it, on the football yeah. team for like, a, for a blink of an eye, but he was, you know. And that 
almost sounds like I'm making that up now as I'm telling you. And I wrote this book. I can't, I can't even believe it myself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then, he, um, I, yeah, I think it was, he loved, then he moved to a different school where it's more competitive and it kind of pushed him out. He wasn't good enough at, at the, at the school that he moved to. So it kind of boxed him out of that. Right. But, scene again. but you know, I go back to Kurt's uh, first record, you know, he, the first album he bought with his own money was an Ario Speedwagon record. I mean, Again, this is not something Kurt was ever going to say to Michael Azarad or anybody that, that he wanted to look cool in front of, you know, but this is the truth. His first concert, when I discovered that, which again, had never been reported ever before, Kurt never talked about it. But when I found out his first concert had been, uh, and again, if I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember this now, it sounds crazy for me even to say, and I'm the biographer here. <laughs> His first concert was Sammy Hagar and Quarterfash. Am I remembering that correctly? Sam, you read the book more recently yes, than I have. And then he showed up to school the next day with a Sammy Hagar shirt on. Yeah. Right. That that again, I can't it sounds like I'm making that up or you're making that up. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that kind of fact was confirmed number one by Kurt's diaries, number one by multiple friends of his. Um, I didn't rely on one thing. I certainly also didn't rely on what Kurt wrote because some of the things he said about his own life were uh, exaggerations. And then you mentioned in there some stuff about sub pop. And, you know, when I was a kid, you always think, oh, hey, Nirvana and sub pop, they were all just probably hanging out and best friends. And you kind of paint a picture where Nirvana wasn't really happy ever on sub pop. Would you say that's true? Again, I don't think that it's, uh, I, I don't, I, I hate to, I feel like I'm just arguing with you on some of these points. I <laughs> right. don't think there's a yes or no. You're, you're, you're stating things a bit too much, like, does all the food at Denny's suck? And I would say yes, but there, <laughs> yeah. I've had a few salads there when I used to go eat with my deceased dad that weren't so bad. They weren't, you know? they weren't um, bad. So I think I'm just going to answer that like the Denny's. Um, you know, I mean, Kurt didn't want to be on Sub Pop. He saw signing to Sub Pop not as a great victory. He wanted to be on SST or one of these other labels. That touch and he go. Had, uh, I think touch and go. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, or Calvin Johnson's label, which, which never put out a Nirvana record, even though Kurt got a K records tattoo. Dr. Freud could have a lot of fun with that one, but uh, there were times where they were happy to be on sub pop. And frankly, sub pop didn't do such a bad job for where Nirvana were. They could have also gotten lost Bleach did get college radio play. Bleach did get Nirvana attention in the UK. And that was Sub Pop's connections that did that. Would Nirvana have become Nirvana without Sub Pop? No. Let's give the credit to Sub Pop there. Oh, definitely. Uh, did, definitely. Sub Pop, did Sub Pop pay Nirvana rapidly or pay any of the other Seattle bands at the time? The answer to that is also no. So, but... Kurt did not think being on Sub Pop was as cool as 999.9 bands in America today would think it would be to be on Sub Pop. But that's the time, the place, and that's the fact that Kurt was uh, really, he, he, he accused Pearl Jam of being a careerist, but he was the ultimate careerist. Music, he thought, was his only way to get out of poverty. And he wanted to be on a label that would pay him, make him a star. And Sub Pop was, was never going to be that label. Right. Um, yeah, and what do you think it was? You know, another interesting thing that I always find uh, weird about Kurt, I guess, is he was always so particular about his drummer. Yet uh, he would play sloppy as hell sometimes. So why is it that Kurt... Puts, you know, what was it in his uh, in his head that was making him go? Well, this drummer has to be absolutely perfect. But if I want to like hit bum notes and kind of roll around on the floor <laughs> and get loose, that's okay. D did you ever figure out why he was so particular about drummers? Well, he had tried drumming himself. You know, that might have been the first instrument he played. I don't think that's unique to Kurt. I mean, there's a band called the Fastbacks out of Seattle that are a legendary band, and I think they've had 36 drummers. Wow. Pearl Jam, Pearl Jam's had as many drummers as Nirvana. So I don't, I don't think that question is necessarily fair to just throw against Kurt Cobain. 
I think uh, the question might better psychologically be like, what was it that Kurt got out of criticizing drummers? And I think Kurt wasn't always happy with the band in general. He also fired Jason Everman, who was a really good guitar player and, right. and did a lot of legendary stuff. Kurt was never happy with the band entirely, and uh, he was a perfectionist. And, uh, you know, Chris Novoselikton, he had the kind of relationship where he couldn't, he could never consider firing Chris because it was Chris's band as much as Kurt's. Right. Um, but he, he could fire the drummers, and he did. But I think the one thing in that story that does, and, and right now I'm actually not very far from Chad Channing's house, I think with Chad Channing, the story gets told poorly. Chad is a much better drummer than history would, would want to give you because Kurt said some negative things about Chad's drumming. And then you get Dave Grohl, you know, to follow Chad after Dan Peters. And you go, well, Dave Grohl is a better drummer. And that's like, I mean, Vermeer was a pretty good painter, but I don't want a Vermeer painting to appear next to a Van Gogh. It doesn't make Vermeer look so great. Um, and that's the way I think it is in drummers. But I think Chad was a great drummer. I actually think he was a pretty damn good drummer for Nirvana. And I think he could have done most of what Dave Grohl did. But Dave Grohl brought a power that worked on the recording of Nevermind in a way that Chad might not have brought, but it, that's just the way history worked out. All rock stars are particular about their drummers. This is not, that, that's not necessarily unique to Kurt. Right. Yeah. And so you, you were talking about how you did lots of, uh, you worked on this for a few years. Uh, did you happen to save all these recordings and transcripts and all that stuff? Do you have that in an archive anywhere? I do. And at, at some point, I don't know where it'll go, but it'll go to a university or, something like that so wow yeah that's um, that's huge i mean know. all those multiple interviews with those and sources and people who are gone now yeah and many of those people are dead you know many many of those people are dead and uh but i mean you didn't ask me about you know something i don't like talking about but i do i'm gonna just jump forward and address it mentally unstable people or people that i mean they're people who believe in QAnon. <laughs> there are people who believe the election was a fraud. Yeah, there are people right. who believe the COVID vaccines implant a chip in you. And there are also people that, that, that fall in that same thing that don't want to accept the circumstances of Kurt's suicide for whatever reason. Right. Um, my personal belief is that people are motivated by the fact that they truly loved Kurt Cobain. They loved his music. They feel a connection. And in the end, they feel betrayed the idea that he would, quote unquote, leave them, they want to blame someone else other than him. And that would make their connection to him truer or easier to handle in a way. What I will say is that I absolutely researched every angle of Kurt's death with extensive documentation. I got numbers of people to talk to me. I was leaked medical information. I saw photos. I, I had all that information. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. I looked at every potential crazy lead that Kurt's death is anything other than a suicide. And anybody who brings that up or thinks that, in my mind, are number one doing a huge disservice to Kurt Cobain, because in the end, his choice was to take his own life. And to deny that humanity of him is awful. Yeah. They're number two doing a horrible disservice to Kurt's family who have to suffer from that. It's one thing to lose your father, your your husband, your son to suicide. It's another to have that be internet Instagrammable speculation in a horrible way. And number three, they're denying the fact that this is a public health crisis that needs to be talked about and not denied. Um, yeah, it's just like COVID. If, if, if COVID is something we are just denying, it's not really real. There are some bodies that prove that that's not the case. And that denial doesn't help our public health situation, right. nor does the denial in Kurt's case. I kind of, yeah, it's the same so thing with, it's the same thing with, about that. right. Same thing about like 9-11 people where it's like, they can't just accept that what it was, it has to be something more. And there has to be, they have to right. attach a conspiracy to it to make it 
digestible for them. So right, they right. they spin some tales. And now with Kurt, you know, there's that terrible documentary with El Duce in there, and people spin all that stuff. So, uh, but I think well, it's also you know, dead now. So you kind of then go, uh, yeah, you go, uh, you know. Is this some grand conspiracy, or is it possible that some of these people had predilections to drug addiction, depression, and suicide? Right. You know, um, I mean, even when I say the ridiculous, you know, horrible statistic that, that two dozen people I interviewed are dead now, there are people who are, well, that's part of the conspiracy, you know? Um, of course. And, uh, yeah. you know, I've, I've written about Jimi Hendrix. I've gotten that in that to a similar degree. And insanely, when I started to write about the band Heart, there are even some crazy people in that world. Well, I'll and tell you what. Like, I'll tell you what. I wrote a book about Chris Bell, which is a niche following inside of a niche right, following. Yeah. And, and there's conspiracy theories about this kid who worked at a burger right. place. Anytime people, especially when people die young, I think they need to have better answers than what's given right now. You did that really well. I mean, you lead up the days to uh, Kurt's death. Uh, very, it's laid out very well. And I'm sure that was a hard chapter to write and a hard chapter to report and talk to people about. Yeah. And if I did it again 20 years later, I think I would have inserted more. When you're when you're telling a story in a book, you don't want to stop every paragraph and put a footnote in and say this medical information was leaked to me from blah blah blah. You yeah. don't you, that ruins the flow of a book. But in retrospect, I might have put more of that just because the denialism of people when it comes to suicide and drug addiction, I'm just shocked at. There's one horrible thing I, I went to one of Kurt's closest people in his life at some point after I did the math and started adding it up. And, and, you know, Kurt did all these interviews where he said, I'm clean for a week. I'm clean for a month. I'm clean for six months. I'm great. Now he said these in multiple, multiple interviews in the last year of his life. And virtually every one of those lines was untrue. And when I started to kind of track his drug addiction and the extent of what it was, and I added it all up, I was like, wait a second here. He's, he's not sober then. And I wanted to believe it. I believed it when I read those stories. And, you know, I, I get that now, but, you know, addiction's a tricky thing. But, but I remember going and asking this person, I said, wait, was he, was he using drugs during all this time when he said that? And the, the response was, duh. Right. And I was like, oh, you know, even myself, who grew up in a family with alcoholism, you know, I want to deny it when it comes to other people. I even want to deny it in my own family. You know, it was so, it was uh, shocking to to know the extent, because I guess growing up as a fan, I didn't realize how early it started um, and then how how it just kind of uh, kept going. I remember you had a conversation there where. Kurt and his sister were sitting on like a swing set and talking and he told her, Oh, I've been clean for eight months. And you're like, no, he was more clean for like a week at that point, you know? So right. I think he wanted to be clean, obviously, but, uh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if the breaking news of my book is that addicts that are in addiction lie, this is not, and that's one of the things that is so befuddling about the messed up people who think they read an interview Kurt did a month before he died where he says, I've never been happier in my life. And then they believe that. And so consequently, they think he couldn't have killed himself on April 5th, 1994. He said he was never happier in his life a month before. That must be true. And it's like, why do we want to believe the one thing he said in a press interview and not believe right. everything else we know about this. Right. Um, and, yeah. And Kurt wasn't going to go on there and uh, open up his heart to, to a journalist. I mean, it's hard to find, well, especially like Kurt, it, Kurt was, not often, you know. Yeah. Kurt was pretty good about in these kind of situations. He could just like, you know, uh, uh, I, I have only interviewed a few Hollywood movie stars, but they all make you feel like you're the most important person in the world. And, you know, that's their technique. Uh, usually it's by spectacled middle-aged men, in many cases, writing these pieces. And 
it's Hollywood actresses flooding in their eyebrows or even Brad Pitt acting like you're the person's bro. And, right. you know, it, 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 this is the entertainment industry. And, you know, no Hollywood publicist is going to let you close to a subject without working through them first. And in Kurt's life, some of that went on as well in his group. He was prepped for some of these interviews that he did. And, uh, but he was also a really smart guy. He knew what to say to make himself look good. You know? yeah. yeah, and definitely, and especially when they had that Vanity Fair piece. I mean, they actually kind of, you, you talk about how they put together a press tour almost where they started reaching out to familiar, friendly journalists combating that bad press and uh you know to any other person i would say well of course they're going to do that but it was surprising that uh you know kurt and courtney did were not happy about that obviously and uh they kind of fought for themselves on that and uh, it was a real downside i mean uh it seems like that was one of the lower points in his life Uh, but of course that's a generalizing yeah but even what you're saying if you think about it it's absurd that you're thinking that well kurt wouldn't do that but uh you know, Kim Kardashian would or Khloe Kardashian or whichever one had an unflattering internet picture, you know, come out and, uh, yeah. you know, or, uh, or, or Bruce Springsteen who had a DWI for a moment, you know, um, pe- people, uh, it's a, that's a human thing. It's not a thing unique to Kurt Cobain, but yeah, Kurt was much more manipulative of the media and in a way, I, I feel like even my magazine, uh, we didn't really fall for that. We, uh, we didn't know where to report Kurt's dissent. Kurt's dissent was difficult for people to know how to report around it because was it a music story? Was it a human story? We weren't investigative journalists for addiction recovery services. We were rock critics at The Rocket. And, um, you know, it was difficult to know where do you start reporting that. And you know, Seattle, unfortunately, had a number of people die. It wasn't unique to Seattle. It's all over America and all over the world. But it sure seemed to everyone else that there was something unique about Seattle's water. And I don't believe there is. I mean, there are a lot of people who die of 27 or in their 20s that aren't Seattle musicians. But a few Seattle musicians did. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, it just so happens Chris Bell also died at 27. I know. You know, to, to, you know I was referring uh, to that. Yeah. Right, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, you've got Chris Bell, you've got Janis Joplin, you've got Jim Morrison, you've got Jimi Hendrix, but then you also have a bunch of other people. Amy Winehouse, the guy, yeah. Pigpen, yeah, Amy Winehouse, Pigpen from the Grateful Dead. I'm pretty sure he was yeah. 27 too. And you know, you know the Chris Bell story. I know a lot about it as well, and uh, that doesn't get in the headlines. But that that had nothing to do with the quality of Seattle's heroin, you know. Right. So. Um, Right. Well, you know, looking back, if you could go back and put out like a new edition of Heavier Than Heaven, is there anything you would do differently other than the footnotes? I wouldn't put footnotes. I would just, I would, uh, I would probably uh, tell a bit more of that story. But I did put an edition of Heavier Than Heaven out a year ago. So there is a new edition that has a, has a new forward and a new end. So there are, there are a couple new pieces to it. Oh, terrific. Um, okay. And that, that edition tells a little bit of the backstory that I'm telling you here. It's not like I want someone to go out and drop their 20 bucks just to read two chapters, you know. But right. I, I couldn't go back and rewrite the whole book. That was impossible. But I could tack a couple things at the start and at the end. So what's next for you? Do you have any projects coming up? Or uh, I know you, you, yeah, you're still I'm, writing. Uh, I am still writing, and uh, I've been working on a memoir that's a little bit about my life and a little bit about Seattle music history. And yeah, that's my project uh, at the moment. And I've got a few other things, trying to do a collection of rocket stuff. And yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. The, uh, isn't there an anthology out of rocket or not? There is not. There's never been anything, and the okay. rocket's not online. And um, well, that'd yeah. be yeah, that'd be a worthy cause right there for sure. Well, it, well, thank you. I mean, I could I could keep gabbing and uh, <laughs> asking you uh, fanboy questions for another yeah. hour. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as I said, I, I I'm a huge big star fan. I'd love to chat with you at some point. We ought to do that when my son is in the background, who's the biggest 
big star fan that you've ever met. And, and, uh, you of course know who Holly George Warren is when oh, she comes yeah. to town, we get together. And, uh, last time we came to town, my son got to go to dinner with Holly. And I think my son was 18 then or something. And, uh, it was hilarious, you know, like, you know, he's the, the fanboy of all time with that stuff, but he'd love to chat with you. Oh, that'd boy. be a, at, any he's time. A right now. Yeah. Anytime. But yeah. Yeah. I, I can chat with, I'm also a big star fan myself, so I could definitely talk. It's great. He got to talk to Holly. She fully did Alex, uh, right when I was doing Chris, I didn't even know that was going to come out. And then. Uh, so it's, I'm glad that Alex got chronicled. He obviously deserves it. I almost picked Chris just cause he's the underdog. So, uh, but yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, it was a lot I of work. The story is even darker, you know? So, oh yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, yeah. yeah, it was grim at points. So, but, uh, it, it yeah, was. yeah, but it was an honor to talk with you. Uh, great work on covering, uh, Kurt and Nirvana over the years. No one's done it better. So, um, yeah, thank you for doing that. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Take care. All right. Take Cheers. care. Yep, cheers, bye.